All right, our next to last signal property to discuss in our list here. In this video, we will define what energy signals and power signals are. So we'll just introduce the definition and discuss them a little bit. In the next video, we'll actually work through a detailed example of computing the energy and power of a signal. So the next video has the example. This video just has kind of the core definition. So let's work through that first. Let's talk about an energy signal first up here. So energy signal. A discrete time signal x of k is an energy signal if and only if its energy, which we denote here by E, is greater than zero and less than infinity. So here is the mathematical quantity that really defines an energy signal. If you compute this quantity E, which we'll show on the next slide, and it falls between these bounds, so E is just a scalar number, then we say that x of k is an energy signal. In words, we say it like this. We say that energy signals have non-zero, because it's bigger than zero, and finite, because it's not infinite, um, energy. So non-zero and finite energy is the key for an energy signal. All right, so that's energy. Now let's talk about power right here. Very similar definition. We have this quantity P, which is the power of the signal, which is again a scalar number, so it's a real valued scalar number. And we say that a signal X of K is a power signal if and only if this value P is bigger than zero and less than infinity. So again, power signals have non-zero and finite power. It turns out that if you're an energy signal, that means you are a zero power signal. It also turns out that if you're a power signal, then you have infinite energy. So we'll get to more of that discussion here on the next chart. So first bullet here, energy and power signal classifications are mutually exclusive. What does that mean? That means if I figure out your value for E and figure out that your value for E is non-zero and finite, meaning it's just some real valued number on the real line, and I declare that you're an energy signal, once I've declared that you're an energy signal, you are not a power signal. So energy signals cannot be power signals. Similarly, if I do a computation on a signal and figure out that you are indeed a power signal, meaning that your power was bigger than zero and less than infinity, then you cannot be an energy signal. So that's what we mean by mutually exclusive. If you're an energy signal, you are not a power signal. If you're a power signal, you are not an energy signal. So that's a nice fact to always remember. It's also nice to know that you don't have to be an energy or a power signal. It's actually possible to construct signals that are neither of these. So that does happen. You can be neither an energy or a power signal. You don't have to be one or the other. This third bullet is very important too. This is one thing that uh, students get confused about. The words energy and power often make you think of units like joules and watts and things like that, but you have to be careful. Often in these classes, especially in discrete time signals, the signals that we're working with, these discrete time lists of numbers are just that. They're just lists of numbers. There's no units associated with them at all. So after you're done computing E, E might be 57, and that's it. There's no units associated with that. Same thing with power. You might compute power and P is 1500, and that's really the answer. There are no units associated with it. It is possible to construct signals that have units and get out things that have watts or joules, but most of the time in this class, the signals you deal with are just lists of numbers. They don't have any units, so don't just arbitrarily slap units on them that make them sound like an energy or power quantity. The best way to think about these energy and power values is really kind of the size of the signal. If you compute E and it's a really large value, that tells you that your discrete time signal is kind of a big signal. Same thing for power signals. If you compute P and get a big value for P, think about that as being kind of the size of the signal. Don't get too bent out of shape about the words power or energy. Another kind of handy fact to keep in mind is that periodic signals are power signals. So if you are dealing with a periodic signal, that is going to be a power signal. If you compute P based on the definition that we'll introduce here in the uh, next video, then you will um, see that periodic signals are always going to be power signals. Before we get into actually doing our detailed example computation of energy and power, let's go ahead and define what the energy and power quantities are, these E's and P's that I've been talking about in this video. So here is the definition of energy. 
the energy of a discrete time signal x of k is defined as this. So basically you just take your discrete time signal, you take its magnitude, you square that magnitude. So now you just have these real valued numbers and then you add up those numbers for all time. So it's just the sum of the magnitude squared of the values for all time. So that's all it is. The definition of power looks very similar. In this inner summation, you're doing very similar things. It's a sum of magnitude squared of the signal. The only difference is there's a limit out front. We actually take the limit as n gets large, so n appears there and there. So in this sum right here, there are actually two n plus one terms, right? To figure out how many terms are in a sum, it's the top limit minus the bottom limit plus one. So that would be n minus a negative n, which would be 2n plus 1. So the number of terms in this summation are exactly the number of things that you're dividing by here. So you're kind of taking an average of the magnitude squared of the signal, and then you're letting n get large. You're end up ending up taking that average over all time. So here's our definition for e. Pretty easy to compute, just a sum squared of the magnitudes. Here is the definition for P, very similar thing. It's a magnitude squared, summing up all those values, but then taking kind of an average value of them. And that kind of gives you a feel too for why periodic signals are gonna be power signals. So we're gonna kind of average over this repetitious thing for all time, and we're gonna get an average value of the magnitude squares of the periodic signal. All right, so that's it for now. That kind of wraps up kind of our core discussion on what energy signals are, what power signals are, how to compute E and P based on these definitions, E and P. In the next video, we'll actually work through a detailed example of computing E and P for a very specific signal.